All right, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome to another interview. We're going to have an interesting conversation. I have Professor uh, John Lennox here, Dr. Lennox, and he uh, is a professor at Oxford University. Uh, Perry Marshall, one of my friends uh, that I've had on, on the channel a couple of times, he, uh, he connected us. And I'm always interested in, in hearing you know, the, the perspective and, and, and looking at, you know, science versus religion and, and evolution, uh, because, you know, the, the, the mainstream narrative that, that science presents to us or that so many scientists present to us, I'm, I'm not really quite sold on there. There's so many things that, uh, yeah. that don't make sense. I think a lot of us, we just, we just take whatever the authority says and, and we believe that. And so I like to challenge this and to, to look at things and, uh, and, and you know, Dr. Lennox is is as a person who who has done that and has made a great case for uh, for for the idea of 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 God and science actually mixing. I think so many people separate those things out. In fact, he he wrote a book called uh, Cosmic Chemistry: Do God and Science Mix? I put a link in the description down below if you guys want to check that out to get some reference. But um, but uh, welcome, Dr. Lennox. Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be with someone who asks questions about these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think more people should. I'm, I'm surprised by how many people just take whatever, you know, whatever news says, whatever, you know, the textbook says, and just believe that blindly. Yes, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, actually. And it leads to a fairly boring existence. Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, is a great hero of mine. He kept asking questions. He was curious. And we need people to be curious because we're bombarded with so many types of information and so on. And in order to make up our own minds, we need not only information, but the wisdom to deal with it and understand what it's telling us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. I'm very big into philosophy myself. And it's, it's funny how they, you know, they asked so many questions back then, but now we don't hardly ask any questions. And, you know, I think that so many people get set in their beliefs. Um, I try to not have any beliefs. I try to have probabilities of, <laughs> of belief. You know, I think that's safer because if you have a belief and someone challenges that belief, you're personally insulted. But if you say, well, there's 95% probability that this is true and 5% that it's, it's not uh -huh. true, then, you know, you can, you can alter that ratio. Someone could give you some compelling argument. You could say, okay, now it's 30, now it's 70, 30. And it's not, you know, you don't have to defend it. Well, it demonstrates that you're open to contrary arguments. And I've tried to spend my whole life being vulnerable. I have beliefs. I have strong beliefs. But they have come about because I've questioned everything. Mm -hmm. And I've been open to their opposites all, all of my life. So I, I think you must be a kind of statistician or mathematician. <laughs> That's <laughs> Uh, I my background well actually my background was computer science I did uh, software ah. development so oh I kind of well look that's at, wonderful <laughs> I look at it from an analytical type of, of viewpoint of the world but I just found also too it's just so many things I look back at my life and things that I believe so strongly I I don't believe anymore and so you know there's so I I, I always have to assume that I'm ignorant as opposed to you know someone else is is ignorant because so many times that has proven to be the case so the best way to learn. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about kind of, you know, a little bit, well, maybe uh, for, for, for people who don't, don't know you, I put a link also guys, if you see uh, against the tide movie.org, uh, Dr. Lennox uh, created this documentary uh, against the tide and actually Kevin Sorbo was in there. Hercules, <laughs> one of Hercules, my, my favorite right. mythological character, Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but, Kevin's um, Kevin's okay. not a mythological character, but it was fascinating, actually, having him as a dialogue partner, both in Oxford and in Israel, go, going over these things, science and God and the rationality of Christianity and so on. So it was a new thing for me. I'm not sure that I'm suited to the cinematographic genre. I prefer interviews and discussions like this. But nevertheless, I, I hope it will stimulate people because, again, it's about the big questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. He's a, he's an interesting character. I'm on his Twitter feed, and he 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 gets some people really uh, really really upset on the on his I, tweets. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> but it's well, good. you yeah. know, when my young day, the only things that tweeted were birds. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> 
So, um, so yeah, so maybe uh, let's start off with a little bit of a background on, yeah, sure. on who you are, how you got into to this, because I know you've you've done quite a few few things. Uh, but uh, but yeah, give give us a little bit of a background. Well, my accent betrays me to those that know. Uh, I come originally from a very small country, Northern Ireland, which hasn't got necessarily the best reputation when it comes to religion and Christianity. But that's part of my story in the sense that when I was growing up, the terrorism, the secular violence, the religious violence, as it's often painted, and there was a religious dimension, was rising. And the, there was a sectarian division in the community. And one of the utterly important things for me was that my parents were very unusual. They weren't highly educated people. My father ran a, a store of the kind that sells everything. But he took quite a risk because he employed Catholics and Protestants and tried to do that equally and was bombed for it. And I once said to him, Dad, why do you do this? Why do you take the risk? Well, he said, look, he was a, a keen Christian. And he, he said, the Bible teaches that every man and woman, irrespective of their worldview, is made in the image of God. And he said, I intend to treat them like that, whatever they believe. That left a, a very deep impression. And the second thing, that left perhaps an even deeper impression was that although he was a keen Christian, he didn't ram it down my throat. Right. He encouraged me to think, and not only about Christian things, but also about other worldviews. When I was, what, 12, 13, 14, something like that, he handed me a copy of the Communist Manifesto, which yeah. is highly unusual. Don't know even where he got it in Northern Ireland in those days. And I said, Dad, What's this for? He said, you need to know other worldviews. Mm, yeah. And that growing up against a background of open-ended thinking was hugely important. So when I got to Cambridge in the early 60s, I didn't do what so many of my fellow Northern Irish people did. I didn't jettison my faith in God because it had become real. It had become my own. My parents had given me evidence and I could see it was living and real in their own lives. And that was the start. But you asked about the interest in um, science and religion. That came very early as well. I had many interests when I wanted to be a linguist. I then wanted to be an electrical engineer. And um, you'd be amused at this. <laughs> when I was at Cambridge, I got interested in computing. Okay. And I could have been in at the foundations of it, but they said, ah. you know, uh, Mr. Lennox, I, I, we, we thought you wanted to be a serious person. <laughs> and therefore, you should stick with mathematics. And I think that was a profound mistake, actually. 1962, <laughs> the, beginning, the beginning of so many things. But anyway, um, uh, my parents had prepared me for, for that by encouraging me to ask questions. And, and therefore, the whole idea of evidence-based thinking right. was very real to me, even as a schoolboy. And I settled on maths because I was apparently quite good at it. And I got very interested in where does maths sit within science? And then where does science fit in the whole picture of the world outside us. Does it tell us everything? And little did I know, of course, that this was going to feature very largely in my life. But I came across a book when I was perhaps 15 by a Cambridge uh, chemist called Robert E.D. Clark. And he wrote a book on science and religion and their compatibility. And he opened up a new world because he talked about things that I'd never thought about before. Like science is wonderful and he was passionate and so was I, but it's limited. How is it limited? Why is it limited? Can't it answer every question? So I got fascinated by all of this long before I came to university. And of course, at university, when people discovered I was a Christian, they said, oh, of course, Irish genetics, you know, all you Irish believe in God, you fight about it. So I was faced with Freud, hard, uh, that kind of argument. And so I got into the pitch and thrust. And I felt, look, here I am at one of the best universities in the world. 
the best thing I can do because I'm interested in truth. And therefore, if Christianity is true, it's going to stand up to discussion and questioning. So, okay, I'm up for it, whatever the consequences. And so in my first week, deliberately, I sought to befriend people that did not share my worldview. Mm. And all I can say is I've been doing it ever since. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting. Uh, sorry, actually, it's it's kind of funny. I, I I had a little bit of an experience with or Northern Ireland. Uh, I I was on the bus uh, taking a trip up there uh, to through Belfast, and uh, it happened to be the twelfth. And I had <laughs> <laughs> I was googling on my phone what's the twelfth because the bus driver was like, well, you know, if uh, if things go bad, I, I'm going to leave the bus, but you guys should be fine. And I was trying to figure out real quick and i you know got a real quick history lesson <laughs> but, I bet um, you did. <laughs> but yeah but but um but yeah that that's really interesting to have that i think so many parents don't raise their children with that open-minded perspective mm -hmm. you know to see the different world views i think so many people uh they they just they have whatever they were taught and that's what they believe and that's what they defend. And, you know, we have all these kind of cultish behaviors that, that people, they want to join a tribe and they don't want to question things. But the more that you look at opposing viewpoints, uh, you know, it's either going to strengthen your belief or, or, or undermine. I think, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, books was, is on uh, uh, kind of on the subject is on Liberty by John Stuart Mills. And he, and he talks about that exact thing. It's like, you know, you, you have to challenge it. Like it's either going to make it stronger, like you're going to be able to defend your position because you, you listen to these challenge ones, or you're going to, uh, or you're going to find that you're wrong. So, um, so, so exactly. kind of, uh, transitioning into like where, uh, where, where you've landed. Um, cause I've talked to Perry Marshall. He's been on, you know, he, he wrote that, um, a book on, 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 you know, looking at evolution and, and the, you know, in, in information being created, uh, wh where do you stand or what, what have you found about this, you know, this whole thing uh, between science versus religion and, and God? Um, how have you found the compatibility or the evidence that, that you found that there, you know, this isn't just all a big bang and an accident? Well, uh, for me, the, the history of science plays a great role to start with. And, I very early on came across Sir Alfred North Whitehead. It was heavy reading uh, for a teenager, but came across the idea that there was a connection between the Judeo-Christian tradition and the rise of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I found that utterly intriguing. Hmm. And you start perhaps with Galileo and then Kepler, Newton, Clark Maxwell and so on. All of them believed in God. And I think C.S. Lewis it was, and I'm old enough to have heard C.S. Lewis in Cambridge. That, that's something else. Oh, wow. But C.S. Lewis um, summarized Alfred North Whitehead's view by putting it this way. He said, um, <clears throat> men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in the legislator. In other words, far from hindering the advance of science with people like Newton and so on, their faith in God was the motive that drove it. And I found that immensely interesting that, for example, that when, uh, when Newton discovered his law of gravitation, which is absolutely fantastic, I used to love teaching that and how you can uh, use it to derive the elliptical orbits of planets around the sun. This is marvelous stuff, you see. But when he discovered that, he didn't say, well, of course, now that I know how it works, I don't need God. Mm -hmm. He took the view, what a marvelous God who did it that way. In other words, he didn't see that God and science were in conflict because they're answering different kinds of questions. And I, I often say, look, the simple way into this, and it helps enormously, I feel, even with the contemporary debate, is to realize that although there is overlap, generally speaking, the natural sciences and the whole matter of uh, the God question are dealing with different uh, 
issues. Let me give a very simple illustration. Uh, why is the water boiling? Well, because the heat is being transmitted through the base of the kettle and it's agitating the molecules of water and it's boiling. Or I could equally well say it's boiling because I want a cup of tea. <laughs> Those are two explanations of the same phenomenon. They right. don't compete. They don't conflict. They complement because they're different types of explanation. The, the first one is in terms of heat physics. The second one is terms of personal agency. And I often say to people, and I find school kids can get this immediately. I say, look, God no more competes with science as an explanation for the universe than Henry Ford competes with science as an explanation for the motor car. Mm -hmm. And school kids will say, sir, you need both. And that's the key. You do need both. Science is marvelous, but it's marvelous because it restricts its questions, mainly. Sorry about that. Mainly, um, it restricts its questions to how things work, but it doesn't deal with the questions of meaning uh, mm. or the questions of value. And uh, that's hugely important to see that. Now, we live, as you're well aware, in a naturalistic dominated world where the academy tends to favor what we call scientism. Science is the only way to truth. Now, I love logic. And that is an absurd statement because the statement science is the only way to truth is not a statement of science. So if it's true, it's false. In right. other words, it's logically incoherent. And I like the view of Sir Peter Medawar, who oddly enough is an intellectual hero for both me and Richard Dawkins, although we're poles apart. And Medawar said it's so easy to see that science cannot explain everything because it cannot answer the simple questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? Um, what is the meaning of life? And we need to turn to religion and philosophy to answer these questions. And I feel a great deal of the heat would be taken out of that debate if we would just realize that explanation comes at different levels. And really, I feel, John, that the heart of the issue today is understanding what we mean by explanation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think I, I like that perspective of separating it out for the, the two reasons, the two things that you're you're looking at, the explanation of the of how it works versus why and the meaning behind it, because I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I've always thought like I always think back and, and and to me, it always comes down to like no matter what you believe, like if you believe in the Big Bang or you believe in like, you know, that they just like somehow happened or, you know, or, or you believe in God that somehow you still get to those questions which cannot be answered by science which is well what happened before the big bang or what caused that or what made the, the all the spark the the all the molecules to be in one specific point you know what happened there's always a what happened before that and then if you go down the the god road then you you kind of get to the question of, well where, where did god come from and where did well right <laughs> well let 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 me stop you there yeah. okay <laughs> These are interesting things to explore. Mm -hmm. Firstly, many people think that if you talk about the Big Bang, you couldn't possibly be a believer in God and vice versa, but that's sheer nonsense. Mm -hmm. Big Bang uh, was actually a pejorative remark by uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, the famous cosmologist who didn't believe in it. Uh, uh, he believed in a steady state universe. And he said, you and your big bang. He was actually one of my examiners at Cambridge and I met him a couple of times. And the point is, the idea of the big bang is simply that the universe had a beginning. But <laughs> the Jewish scriptures had been saying that for thousands of years <laughs> before <laughs> the 1960s when scientists began to think, yes, the evidence that there was a beginning is very strong. So if you look at it that way, the notion of a Big Bang, which simply says there was a start, is entirely compatible with the notion of God being the creator. Right. But I, I like the thing you just pushed in at the end of your statement there, was you have to ask where God came from. And you know, Richard Dawkins 
um, thought he had me in, in the debate I did with him in Alabama, uh, wow. the first major debate, which really gave me a huge public platform and still does. People are still watching it years after the event. This idea that if you, you the idea of God as a creator is absurd because then you'll have to ask who created God and all this kind of stuff. Where did God come from? And my point, well, I made two points. The first one was this. If you ask who or what created God, then the hidden assumption is that God is created. But created gods are idols, and we don't have any difficulty in disposing of them as not being worthy of serious consideration. Uh, the second point is that uh, the claim for the God I believe in is that he is eternal. So your question, who created an eternal God, is meaningless. Mm -hmm. But secondly, your question, Richard, does apply to yourself. You believe the universe created you. So I'm going to ask you your question. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for the answer. Uh, philosophically, of course. Right. Uh, the issue is, do the questions go back forever or do they stop? And I think they stop on both sides. My atheist friends, and I have many of those, I've collected them over the years, and I enjoy talking to them. They tend to believe that you either stop with the universe, the multiverse, or these days it's very popular to stop with nothing. Mm -hmm. If you listen to Lawrence Krauss, for example, on, on the God side, you stop with God. And uh, therefore, you have to decide which side you're on. You don't have to decide whether you stop or not. You have to stop. Right, right. Yeah, that I think that that makes sense. I, I guess I mean, there's there's ways I, I look at it of, of a, you know, of a cosmic cycle or like, I mean, we look at, you know, a, a, a circle or a, uh, you know, a, a Mobius strip. And yes. you know, those those are examples that we have of, of things that don't have beginnings or, or ends. And uh, but they do cycle around, which is is something that's I think is is unique about this, which we don't know. I guess maybe things do cycle around. We, we haven't been around long enough to know if they do or not. But um, but but yeah, you're right. Eventually, you have to get to some point of of, of answering that question, and maybe it doesn't work the way that, that we think it is. But well, I, I guess we're at sense um, that. I mean, I take your point. I, I love the Mobius one-sided, two-sided surface. It's utterly intriguing. But if we look at the consensus of cosmologists now, and this is absolutely independent of religious belief, they have come to the conclusion that there is a singularity, a very real mathematical singularity. Whether you believe in a universe or a multiverse or whatever, there was a start. And that, to my mind, is, is very profound in the sense that it resonates perfectly with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I've never seen anything in science that does anything but confirm that. And not only that, it makes sense. Because when people say to me, the universe started with nothing, I say, well, nothing physical. But God isn't nothing. He created it from nothing. But that's a very different matter. But now, uh, perhaps I, I've been... Uh, following the wrong path in your intention of questions, because you asked me about Perry and information, didn't you? Did did you want me to say something about that? Or yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that's a good segue into maybe how like evolution is compatible and and this and the concept of information and you know the idea that we never create new information or information that exists without a, a transmitter and, and, and a receiver. Uh, how does that all fit into evolution? Because I think a lot of people... With like, great you... difficulty, in my view. Okay. And okay. that's why I find Perry very interesting, because Perry has a nose for a seriously interesting controversy. And uh, when I was younger, of course, uh, the whole rage was that um, you can't believe in God, uh, and Darwin has shown that evolution accounts for everything and so on. But that had to be revised and nuanced because, first of all, very obviously, if you think of evolution in the naive sense, uh, that is, you have natural selection working on random mutations, just take those two things. Mm -hmm. That cannot, by definition, account for the origin of life because whatever evolution does or doesn't do, it assumes life exists in the first place. And it was so misleading to read 
books that were famous and had a huge impact, like The Blind Watchmaker, where Dawkins says that um, this mechanism, natural selection, is the cause of the existence of life and its development. Well, it's not. And it took Dawkins many, many years to admit that he'd been wrong when he said that at the beginning. That's the first thing. Secondly, the, it's clear, uh, obviously Darwin showed it and brilliantly, that uh, natural selection does something, mutation right. does something. But the question is, can they create uh, new levels of things and new information? Now, making that precise is difficult, but here's where computer science comes in and theoretical computer science. And at that side, and that fascinates me, you have ideas that you were suggesting in the way you formulated the question, uh, ideas of um, <clears throat> the, the famous cyberneticist, uh, John von Neumann uh, and so on, that a, a machine can transmit information, but it cannot create any information that's not either in its input or its informational structure. Now, that seems to pose a huge barrier on natural processes, that is natural unguided processes, doing anything significant. And what has interested me, and I confess right away, and the audience will know this anyway, I'm not a biologist. I am very interested in biology, and I've attended many biology seminars, notably those by Professor Dennis Noble here at Oxford. And there's a tale there because Dennis Noble is a hugely original and brilliant thinker. And he has been one of what's called the third way in biology. People who are saying, and he says it explicitly now, that the Darwinian view, neo-Darwinism, doesn't need to be revised. It needs to be replaced. Mm. Now, why is that? Well, it's because many of the dogmas that surrounded notions of evolution up to relatively recently have been proved to be false. Right. And secondly, the levels and the nature of the complexity that we're dealing with in biology have been shown to be far deeper than anybody ever expected. Now, just at the simplest level, I say simple for those of us who know about DNA, but it's not at all simple. Here we have at the heart of life, the longest word we've ever discovered, 3.4. Uh, billion letters. Now, the very interesting thing about that is they carry information. Right. DNA is an information bearing macromolecule, and it's information that relates to the structure of the proteins it, that creates, and they fold, and that folding carries information, and then there's information above that level, which we call epigenetic information. And what people like Dennis Noble and others have discovered, and that's what got Perry into it and me into it, is that these informational levels push back and push away uh, and show that it's naive to assume that these occur by purely natural, bottom-up uh, natural processes in terms of a causation chain. There's something happening top-down. And that is what interests me greatly. You see, uh, let me come to the very heart of this before I get onto a hobby horse, go on for hours. Uh, the heart of it is this. We appear to live in a word-based universe. That's mm -hmm. the way I often put it. It's mathematical dis mathematically describable to a certain extent in terms of mathematical words. And they're very sophisticated and very precise. In biology, we've discovered it's a word based world because of DNA and the genetic code. So you have word, word, word. And whenever we see words at any level, whether they're computer words, words in natural languages, or words in genetics, we immediately infer not downwards to natural processes, but upwards to mind. Right. And that is really, from my perspective, hugely important because not only do Christians recognize it, because I would say, look, one of the best explanations at that level is the statement at the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, 
all things came to be through the word. This is a word-based universe. Word is primary. Everything else is derivative. Whereas naturalism and materialism say uh, mass energy is primary and everything else, including mind, is derivative. So it's the exact opposite way round. And I think what has happened is in their research on the mechanisms of the transmission and development of life and evolution, if you like, the whole concept of evolution is being modified and changed mm -hmm. so that top-down causation is coming in. And, of course, that resonates beautifully with me. It's, in a sense, like music because it's telling me that there must be a mental component in this. My final point would be that C.S. Lewis saw this a long time ago, that mind must be involved in nature. And what fascinates me is uh, people like Thomas Nagel, the philosopher in New York, who is a hard atheist. He doesn't want him to be a god, yet he sees a problem. He sees that if you take a purely naturalistic evolutionary view of, of the development of mind, you're in a problem because why would you trust it? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very interesting, like looking at that, uh, that that perspective. And, and I think that like, you know, I think there's, there's to, in my mind, there's two levels of, I mean, there there's one level where you say, does, you know, is, is everything just a random coincidence and, and chance? Like, is it just all a process of, of natural processes? And, and then and again, we already talked about like, e even if you take that 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 path of thinking you still have to go backwards and keep going backwards and then say where did it begin you know and then how did it begin but but uh but there's a question of you know is it that or is it that it's not natural processes and then there's the higher level of question i think of is it is it uh wh who like which god you know is it christianity is it you know and 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 where i mean where where i fall is 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 looking at like there's no way that that it is just natural processes right I, you know i i couldn't make a compelling argument to say christianity necessarily is is true uh but to me uh like the i, I think there's like a to there there seems to be a leap of of faith to a degree uh, but to just look at what we have and to say that no this happened by random chance to me that that there's no faith needed to dispel that from the evidence that we have, right? That's, that's where like this, this whole thing catches me and catches my fascination so much is because it's like, like you said, you, you have these words, like we're, we're a law-based word-based universe, all these rules that, uh, you know, even, you know, one of the things I always look at is like the biodiversity of, of dogs. Like we breed dogs and there's so much diversity in that mm -hmm. limited set of genetics like we don't even have to you know it, it's there, no evolution is required you you get big dogs small dogs wrinkly dogs hairless dogs different colored dogs different size of ears of teeth of and they're all still sexually compatible there's not it hasn't made that leap you know if we and we've been breeding dogs for a long time and so that that was one of the things that really just it didn't make sense to me about the way that evolution was being taught it's like well it, it's you know you have this at first even even you know that even came back to like the whole noah's ark it's like because people always make the argument it's like oh there can't be you know just one one of an animal but it's like from just one one set if you just have two dogs you can regenerate the entire spectrum of breeds of dogs over time and it doesn't require random mutations because it's all built into that informational system already uh so th those are the things that that really keep me up you know looking at this problem and just saying it's not just as simple as, as what we've been told. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, you know. Would I be fair in summing up your position as saying there's got to be something more than natural processes? There's got to yes. be something more. What that something more is, is still a question, but there's got to be something more. And I, I think that's a hugely important starting point because that turns on its head the naive naturalistic philosophies of our age. There must be something more. And I have a number of friends around here who would stand exactly where you are. Mm. Uh, and they would say to me, yes, there's got to be something more. But then your Christianity, John, uh, that is taking another step 
of faith. And I say, yes, it is. But what do you mean by faith? If you mean a leap into the dark, no way. Because faith in my book is a commitment based on evidence, like my faith in mathematics and science. And they're, they, they, they react and they're surprised. They said, do you believe that there's faith in science? I said, of course. No one would do science unless they believed it could be done. Uh, furthermore, no one would ever do science unless they believed, like Newton and Kepler and so on, that the universe is mathematically intelligible. Now, what I would like to ask you is, why do you believe that the universe is mathematically intelligible? Now, to me, the God solution fits perfectly there. Now, notice I'm being careful. I'm saying the God solution, not the Christian solution, because when it comes to the matter, and you actually explicitly mentioned it in, in the earlier part of your question, uh, which God? I think that has to be decided individually mm. on the basis of what evidence have we got. And that's why in the film with Kevin Sorbo, uh, it turns uh, in the middle of it, we've been talking in Oxford about God and science, and Kevin turns to me and he said, Yes, all this is very interesting, but you know, you are a Christian. How, how do you make that extra step? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, the only way we can solve that, I think, is to go back to where it all started. So we end up in Israel, you see, talking about evidence of a different kind than the scientific evidence. Let's go back to the point I made where I said that scientism is false. Science isn't the only way to truth. Of course it isn't. You'd have to shut half the, uni half the departments in every university. There'd be no history, there'd be no linguistics, there'd be no philosophy, there'd be no uh, languages, there'd be no literature if you restrict to the natural sciences. But these are all rational disciplines. And I would want to say here that uh, taking my cue from science, I want to say science is a rational discipline, but science and rationality are not coextensive. History is a rational discipline, and psychology may well be a rational discipline. And I want to say that I can take evidence from history and from experience, and that's where I get the additional evidence of the specific nature of my faith in Christ and Christianity. It is evidence-based, and, and therefore I'm prepared to go out uh, and discuss it. And <clears throat> the way in which I do that, uh, and this is hugely important because this can be, as you very well know, a very sensitive issue. Because the moment you begin to talk about other religions, people can often think, and they may be right, that you're looking down on them. You know? Mm, right, right. And I have many friends who are Jews and Muslims and Hindus and everything else. And what I say is, and if you permit me to say it now, is this when we come to talking about differences, we must sort out the ground rules. And my ground rule is what my parents taught me that every man and woman is made in the image of God and therefore infinitely valuable. That's point number one. So if I'm talking to someone of a different um, philosophical or religious uh, belief system, I regard them as made in the image of God and as moral beings. Now, that has huge consequences. It means that every religious group, philosophical group, you'll find there are differences in ethics and morality, but they're not as big as many people think. Right. They, there's a, a deep commonality, a regard for truth, a respect, and all this kind of thing upon which we can function. Now, what I want to convey to people is that if I'm questioning something about their religion or philosophy, I'm not questioning their moral status. They might well put me to shame in the way that they live. And once you clear that up, I think we can discuss the differences. And I found it relatively easy to do so. Let me give you one simple example. And that is the heart of Christianity, of course, depends on the existence of supernature and the evidence for it being 
that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, my Jewish friends don't believe that he rose from the dead. My Muslim friends don't believe that he died. I believe that he both died and rose again. Now, it's obvious that those three things cannot be simultaneously true. So how would you decide that? Well, the only way I know is on the basis of historical evidence. And you want to talk to the ancient historians, which I've done and read a great deal of it and written about it. So evidence-based thinking is crucial. So that I want to come to the situation where I believe certain things, but I believe them because I question them thoroughly and as thoroughly as I can at least. And I want to support my beliefs by evidence, not just I shut off my brain, I take a leap of faith and I believe it's true. That isn't genuine faith. That is credulity and blind faith. And that can be really dangerous. Right. That makes sense. So then, so then your first uh, level is to, to ask whether or not there is a, you know, a, a a creator or whether there is an intelligence that uh, that created. But then if you answer that question, you say, you know, which I would agree with you based on that evidence. Yeah, there, there, there has to be like there, this information was not created from any, from nowhere, from natural processes. Okay. Then the next step would be to look at, okay, then what are the different claims that people make? And then which one of those claims has the most, most historical evidence to back it up to say, just like you said in that, you know, all three of those things can't be true. So, you know, if we're looking between those three options, which one's which one's backed up by the most historical evidence that we have and, and to make it an informed decision instead of a faith based decision based on that, if I'm summarizing that correctly. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. You see, I'm a mathematician. You're a computer scientist. So we both know what the mathematical concept of proof means, right. where you start with a set of axioms and you come up with conclusions based on an agreed logic. But you don't get that in any other realm other than pure mathematics. You right. don't get it in physics, chemistry, or everyday life. What you do get is indicators, evidences. And it's like the lawyers say, proof beyond reasonable doubt that they give evidence, but they can't prove it mathematically. I often say to people, you know, they say, can you prove God exists? And I say, well, I would find it difficult to prove mathematically that my wife loved me, let alone God exists. <laughs> but I tell you, I see enough evidence that she loves me that I risked my life on it. And I said, if you're flying to New York and they started flights yesterday, they're very excited we are over here. We could now cross the pond again. Look, can you prove to me mathematically that the Boeing's going to get you to uh, Kennedy Airport from London? No, but you'll commit your life to it, won't you? In right. other words, the fact that we cannot prove things mathematically is no barrier to strong evidence-based commitment. And that's my position when it comes to my Christianity. Okay. Okay. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and then what, um, so, so, so what would you say? Well, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, you know, just about the, the whole thing, cause you had mentioned something about, about how people, uh, you know, they, they believe different, different things and, uh, and you have these different, and, and so all people are valuable, right. In, in God's image. Uh, and or the moralistic, I don't remember where I was going with the moralistic viewpoint that like we're not really that far apart in what we what we believe. And I've always thought it's interesting on the, the argument. Uh, I've always said that no one is a true atheist because a true atheist, like if you truly believe that there was no God uh, since and no morality, then you would just do whatever you wanted to do, whatever you could get away with is whatever is advantageous to you. But no one really in practicality that claims to be an atheist ever actually acts in that way. Because in order for me to believe that, I would have to say that, you know, then, yeah, whatever you could get away with, that's what you should do because there is no should. There, you, there is no moral uh, code because the only way there could be a moral code would be is if there is a, a creator of, of some sort or a god of some sort. Uh, what what are your thoughts on on that when you, you well, know, my, eat this? Yeah, my thoughts are: I wish everybody could listen to what you've just said and understand it, because that resonates deeply with me. Uh, I've uh, 
spent quite a bit of time in Russia, and uh, I can speak some Russian and so on. But Dostoevsky once said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. He puts that into the mouth of Ifan in the Brothers Karamazov, and I think he's right. In other words, if you get rid of God, you get rid of morality. Now, the interesting thing is that hard atheists like uh, Nietzsche and Sartre, they could see that. But right. your contemporary so-called new atheists, although that's a, that, that description is old now, uh, they don't seem to be able to see it. So they want to retain a basically Judeo-Christian morality, a biblical morality, if you like, right. and reject God. And, and they don't see that the two things don't fit. And, and I think you're making a, a hugely powerful point. And it was an atheist philosopher here in Oxford, J.L. Mackey, who, who made the point that if there are any absolutes, and most people I meet do believe in some absolutes, they believe it's absolutely wrong to torture infants, for example. Right. So there are some absolutes. He said it's a very short journey from believing in an absolute to believing in a creator, even though he was an atheist. Yeah. And I really think that argument that you've used needs to be revived and needs to be got across to people that, look, you can be a parasite on uh, biblical morality, if you like, but atheism undermines it. It undermines values. Now, if I step back from that, I see a pattern emerging. And the pattern that emerges is this. Atheism undermines several things. First of all, it undermines rationality. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. I often talk to leading scientists and I say um, to them, uh, tell me about the origin of the mind. And they say something like, well, the mind is the brain. I don't agree with that, but it doesn't matter for this uh, argument. And the brain is the end product of mindless, unguided processes. And I say, look, tell me honestly, I've done this with several world famous scientists. Tell me, if you knew that the computer you use every day was the result of unguided, mindless processes, would you trust it? And here's the interesting thing. I've always got the answer, no, I would not. Right. Oh, I said, well, now you, you've got a problem because you're telling me that the instrument, your brain, that you trust to do science, uh, you wouldn't trust if it was your computer. You've got a huge problem. In other words, <laughs> you're not right. shooting yourself in the foot. You're shooting yourself in the brain, and that's usually fatal. And the next step is that not only does atheism undermine rationality, and I often say to people, you know, you think that I'm not an atheist because I'm a Christian. That's only partly true. I'm not an atheist because I'm a scientist. Right. Because I do believe in rationality, that there must be a ground, and that's what the early scientists believe. Now you just transmute that or transpose it into the theme that you've been discussing, and that is ethics and morality. How are you going to ground them? And this is a desperately important human problem yeah. because relativism in morality is on the rise, as we know. No one knows what to believe and not to think. And uh, very often I meet people who say that there are uh, no truths, but they expect you to believe that as a truth. And the, the whole business of relativism and morality falls exactly for the same reason uh, as the postmodern, you know, I believe the truth that there are no truths. And we need to do something and appeal again. And that's why I mentioned uh, earlier the fact that as we actually look at people, the world around, quite irrespective of belief, we seem to see what some people have called a hardwired morality, basic mm -hmm. things in common. Now, if we didn't have those, civilization would fall apart. And therefore, it seems to me that the modest way of approaching this is to, first of all, admit that that is true and build on it relationships, but secondly, ask big questions about it. 
How is that possibly the case? If all this is, as you say, the result of randomness, etc. But by the way, I meet very few people that believe it's all a result of randomness because I discovered they believe in the laws of nature. Right. And they don't always tell me where those come from. Exactly, exactly. And that, and it's interesting, I think, I think some people will argue, or I mean, well, philosophers have been trying to figure it out for forever with different, you know, the, the question of eth ethics and, and a moral code, and what are the moral laws. And, uh, you know, utilitarianism is, is, I think, what most people fall back to, and they say, okay, well, what is good for the, the majority is, is how we, that's, that's moral, that's ethics, that's how we could define it. But then, just as you said, no one ever advocates, thinks it's okay to torture infants, but if you devise a thought experiment where you have to torture infants in order to save lives, they would not choose to save the lives. Uh, they, they would choose to not torture the infants. They, yes. would, they would think that torturing an innocent uh, in order to save, if you torture one innocent baby, it will save a hundred lives. They, they would choose the opposite. So then it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Like there's no philosophy that I found. I've looked through all the philosophies of, of ethics and I've never found one that is compatible that can explain a rational law that, you know, besides a, a, a basic truth of, of morality that, that is not um, th that we know that is, you know, and I think, you know, Alex, there is a chat. He said here, I think this is the other argument that people make is he says morality can exist without a God. You could argue because we are animals. It's in our DNA to group up and survive. So when you start killing randomly, you get pushed out because you're dangerous. Uh, my argument to that would be that you, if you believe that, then act however you want. Like maybe you have an instinct to preserve and to not kill but if you truly believe that's true, then you, if you can get away with killing someone, you should just go and, and, and do it because you know rationally that, that it's your DNA that just makes you feel like you shouldn't kill people. But if you truly, truly believe it, then you would, you would act differently. But Well, that's, that's a very interesting, Alex. Thanks for your question. I, I would rephrase it slightly. I would say morality does exist without believing in a God. But the point that John has been making earlier, I think, stands that actually intellectually you cannot have morality, as Nietzsche showed, without there being a God to, to guarantee it. And the point is that arguing that it's in our DNA to group up and survive, um, so when you start killing randomly, you will get pushed out because you are dangerous. That may well be true, but that doesn't answer two big questions. First of all, altruism and the shouldness of things. Why should I? And your mention, John, of, of utilitarianism, I think is very important. In fact, so important that a few years ago, I decided to do a degree of all things in medical ethics, which wow. I did because I was hugely interested in this problem. I, I mean, it gives you a bit more insight into what concerns me. My science side uh, concerns me with the status of the universe. Crudely put, is it created or not? And the morality is the status of human beings. Are they in the image of God or not? And utilitarianism, if you look at it, and I'm interested that you search through the various moral systems, and you can find there's a lot of good in them. For example, if you're dividing ice cream, among children, you'd better be a utilitarian. You'd right. better give them exactly <laughs> the same amount. But you see, the problem with utilitarianism is that it works very well if you've got equal centers of power. If you've got six nations, each with the same sort of power, you can say to them, well, if you do X, I'll do Y to you. But once you get one person having all the power, and then you say, if you do that, I'll do this. Oh, really? Will you? <laughs> right, exactly. You see, right. yeah. oh, but you ought. Who says I ought? I'll do what I want. Right. And uh, sadly, during the Second World War and, and before it and afterward, we saw that utilitarianism fails when a vast mass of people want to destroy a, a minority. And they just go ahead and do it because, in their view, it's the maximum benefit to the maximum number of people. Right. And uh, there's Jeremy Bentham all over. So utilitarianism, I, I say, yes, it's very useful. It's a consequentialist view of morality. And I always hope 
that I and my family will take into account in any moral decision the consequences of that decision. But those aren't the only thing. The decision could be wrong in its own right, which is why we need to think about people like Kant and, and others and bring them into that discussion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting. I, I think how how they all those systems break down at some. There's always some way you can find a a an exception or you know mm -hmm. some some circumstance where you would go against whatever that ethical philosophy says. And then when you ask yourself the question of why, it's it's just because because it's the right yeah. thing. It's, it, that's the 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 root that's, answer that we always come to. That's right. There's an innate sense of rightness, which brings me back to the fact that, to my mind, this commonality of moral norms is evidence that we're made in the image of a, a creator who's independent and external to us. So tell me, we're we're. Uh, coming close to the of running out of time here but i wanted to uh you know talk a little bit about kind of what you're what you're doing uh by the way i also did talk to professor noble as well we had him on the channel as well it was oh it was great, great conversation yeah yeah uh great guy and uh but i wanted to kind of you know introduce uh everyone that's listening and and, and guys by the way this is <laughs> a lot of people are like why are why are we talking about this on, on Bulldog Mindset. And it's just because these things fascinate me. I think it's, you know, part of the reason why I like these kind of discussions is because one of the biggest things that, that I try to teach on this channel is thinking for yourself, like actually questioning and, and thinking of things. And, and this is a, a great place where, where I think that so many people just listen to what quote scientists say uh, instead of actually thinking it through. But I want to look at what your, so your book, I put a link in the description down below, maybe uh, tell people about what, what is kind of the thesis of that book and, and what, uh, you know, if someone's interested in that book, what can they learn or what do you dive into in that book? Well, I've written several books, but the, the one you're referring to is Cosmic Chemistry, Do God and Science Mix? And that's the distillation of a lifetime's thinking uh, about the nature of science, the nature of explanation, the power of science, the value of science, but the limitations of science, and how uh, the almost intuitive attitude of the early modern scientists like Galileo and Kepler and Newton and so on, was was touching a deep nerve that they were doing science in a sense they were thinking God's thoughts after him. And there's nothing incompatible about doing that. And in fact, what I'm arguing in the book is not the A that God and science mix very well, but that science and atheism do not mix well at all. There's a flip side to this whole debate. And I want to raise some of the considerations that lead me to believe that atheistic presuppositions have had an undue effect, not only in the morality and the philosophies of our nations, but also in the way in which we approach science, that we can limit the definition of explanation almost unconsciously, so that God mustn't put his foot in the door, as as Richard Lewinton, the famous geneticist at Harvard, once said. And he pointed out, he said, look, it's not that the methods of science compel us to do that. It's our a priori materialism that compels us to do that. And I want to bring people up to speed. It's meant to be an introduction to the debate so that, as you said a moment or two ago, that people can make up their own minds. I don't want to make up their minds for them. Right. I, I trust people to make up their own minds. Now, in addition to that, last year, I put out a book called 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. And, and that's a very different kind of book because that's discussing the status of human beings, really, in light of... Um, theoretical and actual computer science, AI, AGI, and all the rest of it. But that's really a topic for another time. That's interesting. I, I have an, an interesting theory. I mean, it, it's it's kind of, I say it's somewhat in jest, but then I'm, I'm a little bit, well, maybe this is actually true, but I have this theory that uh, that we're in a circle and we're going to, technology is going to create God and then he's going to create the universe and that cycle repeats over and over again <laughs> but you know it's just just something <laughs> i i can't but um 
but but so guys check out check out the book and then and then the i've got the link here for the against the tide movie.org uh and then one one last thing i kind of want to throw this in here throw you a little bit of a curveball here because uh, i know people are going to expect me to ask some of these uh these these questions and i'm i'm curious what your thoughts are on this uh what about the two two ideas of one aliens cuz you know, it could be that aliens that it, it sort of fits the at least, you know, not looking at the historical evidence, but just looking at the, the evolutionary evidence, you know, aliens could have created this information, could have created life on Earth and 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 designed that. Uh, and then the second one is that we're living in a simulation because, mm -hmm. you know, when we look at the science of uh the, the universe is pixelated. There are, you know, Planck's constants. There are uh, universal, like you can only go so far. There is a, a, a limit. It's it's not analog. It's digital, right? We think things are analog. What are your thoughts on on those kind of uh, explanations for 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 where we are in, in, in the world that we live in? And you'd like an answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, we can go, if you've got a little bit of time, we could we could delve into this a little bit. But no, I'm just no, curious no. to get your well, take on, on these I ideas. I expect you've had my friend Paul Davis on your show, have you? I haven't. I don't think I've had him on. Oh, wow. Paul Davis of Arizona State University, who directs the Beyond Institute and who won the Templeton Prize. He's one of the foremost thinkers about this. And he's written oh, okay. a book called Are We Alone? And in London some years ago, I attended the launch of the book. And the two of us had an interview on the radio about aliens and so on. And it was very interesting to hear him. He's a brilliant physicist and he writes beautifully, brilliantly. He <laughs> said, well, as a scientist, I'm afraid I think we probably are alone. But as a human being, I hope we're not. Hmm. And then they came to me and they said, do you believe we're alone in the universe? Uh, do you believe in extraterrestrial intelligence? I said, well, it seems to me there's one very big one, and he's called God. <laughs> and, of course, that got a chuckle. But I was quite serious. From the biblical perspective, we're not alone. Right. Now, we could talk for a long time, and, of course, we're limited in terms of evidence, the existence of angels and all this kind of thing. But it seems to me that our world is much more sophisticated and complex than we uh, may admit. And uh, God has told us about some of the creatures that exist. I'm not entirely sure he's told us about everything. Mm, right. uh, and therefore, I am very open-minded on, on what we might or might not discover. It wouldn't affect my faith in God or Christ in any way whatsoever. It would simply mean that, well, let, let me put it another way. One of the things that has always impressed me deeply is that at the very beginning of Genesis, God told people to do science for themselves. What I mean by that is he put them in a garden and he said, you name the animals and the trees and everything else. Now, naming taxonomy is the fundamental intellectual discipline. Mm. And there was God really launching science on the world. And that, to my mind, is a huge mandate for what scientists do. You get on with it and you find out things. I'm not necessarily going to directly tell you them. And of course, the Bible is no textbook of science. It never was intended to be. So that would be my first point. And uh, the, the the second uh, question, remind me what it was. I, I'm older than you and I, I forget. The, the idea that we're living in a, in a simulation. Oh, in a simulation. Or perhaps layers of simulation, perhaps. Yes, that, well, uh, <laughs> again, Paul Davis, I'll refer to him because he writes a bit about this. I don't really know what to think about it, except that I instinctively reject it because we are capable, I believe, of distinguishing between something that is a simulation and something that isn't. A weather forecast isn't the same as weather. Passing the Turing test to come into your field uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you are a human being and, and so on and right. so forth. And, and therefore, because we have the capacity to distinguish between those things, I'm not sure that we are ourselves simultaneously being fooled by a divine simulator. And then I'm not sure what that would mean. 
Uh, how we, what exactly would it mean we're living in a simulation? Uh, that would perhaps change the definition of simulation. I wouldn't know what we're talking about. So <laughs> on those two impossible issues, I, I think uh, that's all that this little braid has to say. Well, I appreciate I appreciate your perspective on it. I, um, out of curiosity, have you read uh, the My Big Toe by uh, Thomas Campbell? No, should I? I think you should. It's a three book series. I think you'd find it very fascinating. It's very uh, out there at first when you read it, but it's it's My Big Toe, My Big Theory of Everything. And I forget he was, he's a oh, nuclear T-O-E. physicist. T-O-E. Sorry, I'm with you. T-O-E. My yeah, T-O-E. Theory. My big theory of everything. I'll have a look at it, surely, yes. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that, like, his 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 belief or what, he, what he's come to is that we're living in a simulation, but it's a simulation in God's, in the mind of God almost. Like, it's, like, different layers, like, like the, all of creation, everything is, like, we all exist almost, like, you could almost say, like, uh, I think, uh, like like a dream, uh, the, the or dream. like Hamlet, or Macbeth in the mind of Shakespeare. Exactly, exactly, and the, exactly, 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 mm -hmm. and and that all of these mechanisms, like there's the like all the physics and everything works within this, and uh, and the supernatural just exists at a higher level of simulation, like a simulation yeah. within the So it's like we're well, in a computer program that is is a. A, a spiritual program or a mind program that exists in this this machine, but then there's another machine and another machine, and it goes up. and, and God is this infinite level of 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 thought and mind. And at first, when I was reading through the book, I I almost put it down because like this is. But then he makes so many. I, I think you'd find it fascinating. Yeah, well, thank you yeah. very much for yeah. the reading tip. And you know, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Yeah, yeah, same here. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. And and guys, uh, like I said, definitely check out uh, the his latest book. And then against the tidemovie.org. I still have to watch it myself. I'm gonna definitely check that out. And yeah, you're welcome back any any time. And well, I would, I'd be delighted you. sometime in the future. And may I mention that I do have a large website, johnlennox.org, with lots of debates and the debates with Dawkins and Hitchens and Peter Singer and lots of people like that. Let me put that up there, uh, John. It's uh, Lennox.org. Yes. Okay. Make sure I've got the right one here. Put the link in the chat. Yep. Here we go. Okay. So, guys, that link is in the chat. Uh, thanks again for for joining. My us. my absolute pleasure. Thanks for the interesting, very interesting dialogue. Yep, same here. And goodbye, Thank and all the very best for your program. Get Thank people you. thinking. Thank you. Bye-bye.